Um, yeah, so to clarify, I'm an environmental humanities scholar. My background is in cultural theory, uh, philosophy and arts based thinking. So that's the lens through which I'm approaching things. I'm not a neuroscientist um, and I'm not a physician. So I just want to be really clear about that. So, yeah, my my research is concerned with how we might collectively make new kinds of pathways both literal pathways, uh, neuro, neurological pathways in our thinking, and also metaphorical pathways in order to construct um, new ways ahead, new ways of moving into the future. And this, for me, this, this requires the work of resisting um, the sort of old and convenient pathways, the familiar habitual pathways, um, which are constantly kind of pulling at us to go in um, more familiar directions in, in one way or another. So we might call those kind of habitual or familiar pathways, things like social, uh, societal norms um, or economic norms, psychological norms. Um, in particular, interest to me is an idea that I um, uh, am working with often around the, the idea of capitalism as an internalized uh, being that's working through me. It's not just out there in the world of economy or politics, but that actually some of the value systems um, inherent within capitalism are kind of uh, are, are working through my body. I've grown up into a set of cultural and societal ways of being, um, value systems around speed, around productivity, around um, what is worth, what is valuable. Um, and, and, and profit and the, these sorts of uh, themes can become internalized within us and within our bodies and frame the kinds of relationships, psychological, uh, neurological relationships that we're having with ourselves um, in terms of emotions like shame, like guilt um, and things like that, which further serve consumerism and, um, and certain ways of being in the world that can separate us from a sense of uh, nature or, or ecological connection. So one of the questions that I'm working with particularly is around, or, or at the moment at least, is around our experience of place. Um, and I've come to, or for a while, I've been naming this exp exploration as a kind of eco-somatics. Uh, somatics, for those of you familiar with the word, comes from the um, uh, soma, the Greek word soma, um, which means body. Um, but it also has almost like a slightly more amplified notion of body. So um, what we understand as our body, not only in an anatomical way, but in a kind of, again, a kind of felt experience of ourselves as bodies. Uh, I'm interested in bodies in part because this uh, really is my first landscape. This is my first um, geography, my, my first place that I am in the world from and within. Um, so a kind of sense of intimacy in an embodied ecology that is going on inside of me and outside of me and my relationship of this inside to outside is what interests me. So a question that I'm uh, concerned with is how we might enrich and empower our relationships with place through feeling ourselves more fully as place, not just in place, but feeling that we are also place. Um, and my uh, hunch, my speculation, is that one gateway towards exploring this kind of question might be through the lens of attention. And we're going to look at that a little bit today. Um, I also think there are other kinds of gateways. This isn't one way, but um, lately I've been interested in this idea of attention. So as a student of embodiment practices alongside, even though my um, academic background has been in cultural theory and humanities, um, I've had this parallel interest in movement work, dance-based work. Um, I've danced most of my life in various forms, um, contact improvisation, um, all kinds of body-based um, practices and inquiries, body-mind centering from Bonnie Bainbridge Cohen. I've been involved in, in her work for, for, for several years. Um, and as a student of embodied practices, I've, I've learned that where my attention goes, my attention, my intention also follows. So my action in the world tends to follow. So if my attention in my head is drawn in one direction, then my intention, my kind of movement into the world tends to follow wherever my attention has gone first. 
And I'm going to start the slideshow now uh, to, to share some more slides um, and some quotes that might help kind of explore this a little bit more. So let me have a look, see. I'll share my screen. Here we go. Okay. And if possible, those of you with your videos on, can you just give me a little thumbs up so you can let me know that you can see that? Grand, okay, lovely, thank you. Great, so attention, as I said before, um, becomes or is related to intention. And I've put up a few quotes here from um, the work of artists and theorists called Jenny O'Dell, um, who's working actually in the field of, of technology studies um, over in the US. And uh, she has a book that I'll, I'll, I'll um, show you the, the front, front image, front cover of in, in a moment in the next slide. Um, and she writes that as physical beings, we are literally open to the world, suffused every second with air from somewhere else. As social beings, we're equally determined by our context given that all of the issues that face us demand an understanding of complexity. And when she says all of the issues that face us, she, she um, is referring here to um, the kind of complex interrelation of um, environmental issues and social justice issues that, that um, are revealing themselves to us in, in our current climate. Given all of the issues that face us demand an understanding of complexity, interrelationship and nuance, then the ability to seek and understand context is nothing less than a collective survival skill. And it is with acts of attention that we decide who to hear, who to see, and who in our world has agency. In this way, attention forms the ground, not just for love, but for ethics. So here, context is um, a word that she's using and I'm kind of exploring uh, place as this idea of context as well this idea of how we are in relation to um, what is inside of us and around us uh, oh, can I do this here we go so this is the um, as I said this is the work of uh, artist and theorist Jenny Adell it's a little bit pixelated, sorry, but that's the, um, the screenshot of her, uh, her book called How to Do Nothing, Resisting the Attention Economy. Um, and she uses this idea of the economy of attention, again, uh, in a similar way as I was speaking about um, the idea of internalized capitalism. She's bringing ideas around um, what we're buying, what we're selling, what we're, uh, what's up for grabs in the world into these kinds of arenas that we might not ordinarily think of as economies. Um, such as our attention, where we're physically, neurologically um, bringing our minds into, into our environments around us. And another theorist who's really uh, greatly influenced my, my work and my thinking over the last few years is Donna Haraway, um, and particularly uh, this book from, I think it's 2019, Staying with the Trouble. Um, and I just wanted to put that up there also as a, as a reference. So uh, one of the things in, in Donna Haraway's work that, 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 that is interesting to me is this idea of uh, reality being an active verb. So again, linking to this sense of where we're creating the world that we're in through the ways in which we're placing our attention within it. Um, and I've put, how, so how do we create new neural pathways? How do we think differently? Um, not just as individuals, but also as communities and countries and, and cultures. Um, and, and another quote from um, uh, theorist Michael Marder, what would it mean to occupy public space without appropriating it, to manifest a multiplicity of bodies in a locale without asserting a sovereign right over it? What would it not imply being in a place without laying claim to it, being there for others? So again, this idea of occupying place, being in spaces, being in places, in what I would call non-normative ways, um, ways that might not be ordinarily familiar with, with how to be in space without appropriating it, um, without laying claim to it. Uh, 
sorry, I'm just, I think I just <laughs> let somebody else in. Hi, welcome if you're just joining us, welcome. So, um, yeah, this, uh, I'm going to backtrack for a moment and just take a pause. In fact, maybe everyone just take a little breath again, just connect into your bodies. It's a lot of information I've just given. And just feel how this is landing for you. So I'm going to keep kind of circling back around these themes, saying the same sorts of things in a different way. And again, that's just to allow, um, or the, 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 my interest is how we might allow um, information to, to, uh, to enter into us through different forms, through different um, sort of circling back around allows the same, the same thing that's being said to sort of drop in at different layers. So um, yeah, I've written that uh, inseparability is inextricable to living. It's central to being a being. So we depend upon others. We're not ourself without others. We can't be a self without being a self with others. Um, and the idea of a self is always already somehow incomplete because myself is already made up of many human and non-human selves. The bacteria in my belly is me and also not me at the same time. Um, my mother that nursed me is, is within me. Her, her, her genes are within me in some way, both me and not me. Um, the vitamin D that my skin takes from the sun as it did this morning, um, it, it allows me to be in life. It is both a part of me and also somehow not me. So it's impossible for me to be a self alone. Um, I need the interchange of air, of food, of warmth, of shelter for survival. I need all kinds of different human and non-human others. And I like to refer to this as a kind of intimate ecology of which we're inescapably a part. We're always in the entanglement of this multitude of relations. We're all joined together somehow in a, in a we that's um, often impossibly wide for us to comprehend through our minds. Um, so many of us, perhaps, or, or those of us kind of working in these, in these fields, um, might be familiar with the theory of this, with the ideas of this, but the experience of it um, can often be much harder for us to grasp. Um, and particularly in certain sorts of contexts, like within a classroom, we might be we might have the experience of it when we're out walking in a woods, um, but the minute we're just in our living room, we can find it a bit evasive, a bit elusive. Um, so I've said that this notion of inseparability can feel physically, emotionally, and psychologically hard to um, really hold within us in a felt sense, even if intellectually we can understand ourselves as connected. Um, and in fact, using terms such as connection and disconnection can sometimes seem to unhelpfully reinforce things. It makes it sound as if um, the removal of these relationships was even a possibility, as if we ever could be disconnected. Um, and my um, belief is that we cannot be disconnected. We can only feel ourselves to be. Many of the students that are interested in the kinds of um, master's programs that we offer at Schumacher um, and I would, you know, in very much include myself in my own experiences of my life. Um, uh, the students and, and many people are coming with this sense of um, a desire to feel more connected, to be more connected in a way that they can really engage in the world and bring their gifts into the world, whether that's their activism or their, their intellectual um, uh, pathways. But this notion of like wanting to feel more connected and so that's the question that I've been working with. How do we, how do I support myself and my students to uh, connect into this notion of that the work perhaps is on the feeling ourselves to be connected rather than necessarily um, uh, setting it up as some mysterious thing of if only we could connect, that actually that connection is already there and already present and exploring some of the ways that we might um, enter into that gateway to, to feel ourselves to be more a part of the world. Oh, uh, next slide. So 
most important in this is the idea that how and what we feel can change and can be changed and many of us I'm sure will be you know very familiar with this that what we feel about someone about something can often change and can be changed and that we can practice these changes we can practice forming new pathways um, we can choose to cultivate our attention in ways uh in ways through which we can sustain change. Sorry, is there an error there in the slide? So we can choose to cultivate these kinds of relationships, these kinds of sustainable, sustaining relationships. So there are many pathways that we might take towards feeling ourselves to be more as place, more in place and as place. Um, I sometimes use the word place full, full of place. Um, so some examples include becoming more attuned to the weather, the changes in seasons, um, which my colleague Andy um, invites in in his, in his teaching sessions on the, on the Masters. Um, we might become more knowledgeable of the names of um, the plants and the, um, uh, and the flora and the fauna around us. Um, we might become more familiar with the patterns and the pathways of the... Sorry, that's my uh the patterns and the pathways of the creatures that we cohabit with um we might learn the social the cultural the geographical histories of our given locations the peoples that resided in the places that we exist in um prior to us the the um uh, particularly those of us in in living in colonial uh uh in the histories of colonial culture um particularly those histories whose visibility or, or lack of visible advantages um, uh, have, a, have oppressed others in certain ways. So you might be familiar, perhaps um, anyone coming from the US at the moment, um, there's a practice of uh, naming unceded territorial lands. Um, so somebody might say, uh, and I'm afraid I don't have the, um, being not, not from the US, I don't have the, the specific knowledges, but you, you might have heard somebody say, for example, um, I live in Chicago, unceded territory of, and then they would name um, the indigenous uh, uh, tribes and communities that have lived on those lands, that to whom those lands belong to prior to um, Chicago being named as Chicago. So these are ways that we might cultivate our attention, um, become attuned to practicing new pathways. Um, so at, at their core, I, I would say these are all forms of paying attention. We, we cultivate um, placeful relationships when we tend to them, um, when we give them our time, our energy and our effort. Um, and alongside this, we can also practice orienting towards our basic state of interconnectivity that I was speaking about before by building a greater capacity for our attention. So here um, I'm following the idea that Jenny O'Dell, but also other theorists are, are, are speaking of around attention being a kind of renewable resource, um, something that can both deplete and diminish, but also something that can be replenished and flourish again with the right kind of tending to and the right kind of cultivating, um, a little bit like soil. Uh, I've also written it can be a kind of muscle, um, something that we can stretch and strengthen. And in doing so, we might become more flexible in our use of attention. So if we're only ever focusing in a very small field of awareness, then we tend to stay in that field of awareness. If we begin to broaden a little bit, we can increase our flexibility, we can increase our capacity for a wider lens of attention. And uh, the Proto-Indo-European etymological root of the word attention, I have a bit of a love for et etymology, it just often throws up all kinds of interesting uh, connections. So from the Latin, attention in the English language comes from the word tendere, um, which comes from ten, uh, meaning to stretch. So I like this notion of attention, um, the kind of European, at least root of that word, means to stretch at something. So we can practice stretching towards the world. So um, a useful exercise that I've been experimenting with lately, and as I said, I've been bringing into my classroom environments, um, comes from the developing field of nervous system and trauma-based research. Um, and it comes 
the, the exercise that I'm going to do with you comes specifically from the work of a practitioner called Irene Lyon. Um, and uh, she follows from a Feldenkrais tradition. Um, so somatic practitioners such as um, Moshe Feldenkrais, um, long past now, but one of the kind of founding fathers really of um, body work and um, uh, somatic practice. And I can put some of these links in if you want to, to follow them up afterwards. So this exercise involves learning how to bridge our attention. Uh, the intention, intention, <laughs> attention, intention. So we're learning how to bridge our attention through orienting to the different layers of our sensory environment. Um, the intention is to explore layering the awareness of sensory experience so that we can simultaneously, simultaneously feel ourselves internally and tend to external stimulus and maintain a sensory connection to the interface, the place where self and world touch. So this idea of an internal connection and an external connection and a sense of that place where the internal and the external are meeting. And often um, uh, this notion that this might be much more permeable than we might usually think of. Um, we think of our skin often um, within a kind of more Cartesian uh, European lineage such as that that I've been born into, for example, we think of the skin as this sort of container, this separator. Um, and yet, as we know, things, it's more poor, much more porous than um, we often think that we're, things are coming in through the skin, air is coming in, nutrients are coming in. Um, so this idea of the internal and the external always being a slightly permeable, rhythmic, um, uh, porous and flexible boundary rather than a rigid, something rigid or excluding. So this place and then this place where the self and the world touch this, this intermediary uh, contact zone, as Eve Lomax often speaks of. So for some of us, um, it can again, this can feel a bit wordy. Um, for some of us, an exercise like this uh, can sound really, really complicated. <laughs> what am I asking you to do? Um, but it's actually really deceptively simple. Um, and we'll have a go at this together. Um, we'll have a go at it together in a few moments and, and, and I'll talk you through it. Uh, yeah. So I've said um, the, the practice of bridging our attention is, is actually really basic um, in some senses and in other senses, it can be really profound at the same time. Um, we aren't really doing anything other than being with ourselves in our environment. I'm going to say that again. We aren't really doing anything other than being with ourselves in our environment. And yet through this, we're also coming to understand ourselves in a relational environmental context. We're attending to the experience of an ecology as something relational. And my understanding is that if this interests us, if, we're, if we feel called to it in some way, then these are things that we can keep practicing, orientating to ourselves and each other in this way, that we don't have to um, know how to do this to begin with, but we can explore and we can, we can practice to develop these skills, to begin to hone our capacity, to deepen our attention to the world around us, within us and alongside us. And through this, we're practicing orienting to place in a way that connects us both to ourselves, to each other, to other kinds of bodies, the many, many other kinds of bodies that we're coexisting with at all times, human and non-human. And in doing so, we're deepening our attention to the world with us, the world that is coexisting, connected, always a part of us. We're always in contact, always touching the world. Um, we're always of and in the world. This is inescapable. And again, this can often feel quite heady, and yet we can cultivate the quality of this kind of relationship through our bodies. It's the texture and tone, the richness of this relationship. So I'm going to stop sharing these slides now, and again, I can uh, make them available for you a little bit later on. So, yeah, I'd like to invite you to turn off your video if you if you have it on for now, and. Um, we're going to have our video off for the next 20 minutes or so. 
Um, you don't have to, you're welcome to keep it on, but um, just for you to have a sense of privacy, really. Um, but please stay close enough to your screen so that you're able to hear my voice. So as I've said, what we're going to practice now, what we're going to experiment with is really deceptively simple. Um, and yet at the same time, there's a lot going on beneath the surface. I'm going to be asking you to put your attention in multiple places at the same time, your attention with yourself, with the world that you're within and the interface between. Um, for some of us, this might feel really, really easy, almost too easy. And there can be a sense of boredom <laughs> and spacing out, checking out, like you're not sure what's going on. And for others, it might feel much harder. And there might be a sense of numbness or frustration or resistance. And I just wanted to say that it's all really, really welcome. There's not a particular experience that I want you to be having here. Um, there's really nothing to strive for. There's absolutely nothing to get right. It's really just an exploration. Um, so I'm going to move my screen a little bit too, just so that I can get myself comfortable. So wherever you are, I'm going to invite you to connect in, first of all, with your breath, as we did at the very beginning of this session. You really don't need to change anything about your breath. In fact, you're noticing more how your breath is already changing. Making no effort, just feeling your breath. Getting this sense of the internal landscape of the breath. Hmm. Having a sense of the light that might be there behind your eyes if you have your eyes closed. And I'm going to invite us to begin actually with our eyes open. So if you've naturally closed your eyes in order to connect in with your breath, let's see if you can open them and still have a sense of your breath, attention being with your breath. So you're going to have a little look around the space that you're in with your eyes. I'm gonna invite you to move your eyes fairly slowly not to jerk them around too much, but just to look slowly around the room that you're in. Let's see if you can find an object, something that draws your attention in your space. It can be really anything at all. It might be a plant, it might be a chair, it might be a book. And once you've found an object that draws your attention, I want you to stay uh, looking at this object. Notice the color of this object, the texture of this object, the shape. Notice how the light hits it. So you're almost looking at this object as if you've never seen it before. Looking with fresh eyes at it for the first time, getting really curious, allowing your attention to drop into a level of detail, noticing as much as you can possibly notice about this object. And from here, I'm going to invite you to feel your breath. And as you do, again, notice if you've tried to change your breath. So without changing anything, just notice if you can feel yourself breathing. And if you can stay with that object 
whilst feeling yourself breathing. So your eyes are open and with the object that you're looking at. And your attention is also at the same time with your breathing. And then let your eyes begin to move slowly to another object in the room, something else that you can see. So scan around the room, find something else. And when you've found something else, you're going to pause there and just stay looking at this next object, this second object that you're looking at. And again, allow yourself to get really curious about it. the colors, the shapes, the textures. And notice if in looking at this object, you've lost a sense, a felt sense of your breath. Some of you might have, some of you may not have. And again, see if you can stay looking at this object and connect into the feeling of your breath. And this time I'm going to ask you to close your eyes if you feel comfortable doing so. And notice if it's easier or Harder to keep your attention on your breath when your eyes are closed. And then opening the eyes. And scanning around the room again. Finding another object something else that you can see. And when you found something else, again, just pausing with this new thing. And allowing your attention to fully take in this object. Again, almost looking as if it's the first time you've ever seen this thing. What size is it? What space does it take up? What's the space around the object? We're gonna spend the next couple of minutes just scanning through your environment in this way. So, and allowing your eyes to move slowly to find something else that you can see, pausing with this new thing, taking it in, noticing the space around it, noticing the relationship of it to other objects. And then moving your eyes in your own time to look at something else. So what we're really doing is just looking around the space around us, but in this kind of more deliberate um slowed down way. And every so often, just noticing if you've lost the feeling of your breath. And connecting back into that sensation of breath moving on the inside, seeing how possible it is to scan your eyes around the room with these objects, whilst also feeling yourself breathing.
And at any point, you're welcome to close your eyes, to connect back in, to rest if you need to. And as you're looking, scanning the environment you're in, pausing, moving, pausing with something else, I'd like you to also begin to notice the spaces in between the objects that you're looking at. So you're now scanning round both objects and the spaces between the objects. And again, when you uh, sort of land your attention on a particular object or a particular space in between objects, just pausing there so you can really fully take in the color, the light, the shapes, the details. I'd like you to see if you can find the furthest thing away from you in the space that you're in, the furthest thing away from you. And then see if you can find the closest thing to you. And that might bring you right in even to your clothes or to jewellery on your body, glasses. And make sure you're including what's above you, what's below you. And again, just notice if you have at any point lost this sense of your felt feeling of your breath in your body. Not making anything wrong, just noticing if in your shifting of attention, you've lost the feeling of yourself breathing. And seeing what it's like to Bring that attention back to the breath again. And to continue your visual exploration around the room with the breath. So we're bridging this connection between feeling ourselves on the inside through the breath. And experiencing through sight the external world. And of course, we don't have to focus solely on sight. There might be sounds that you can hear around you. And you might want to pause your attention with a sound. Really hear the textures, the tones of this sound. What direction is it coming from? How loud is it? How close is it? So you're still scanning through your environment in this slow and deliberate way. And we're going to invite another layer into this exploration. I'm going to ask you to feel the points of contact where your body is touching uh, either the chair or the floor, something that you're sat on. So um, we call this your sit bones, the um, base of your spine where you're sat on something. So 
See if you can feel uh, the very simple uh, sense of contact with the floor or with a chair. And again, there's no need to move. You're just sensing the places where maybe your arms are touching your skin or your clothes. What are your legs touching? What is your back touching? What are your feet touching? And you might want to close your eyes if it supports you to uh, focus your attention on this sense of the touch of this contact of your body with all that is not your body, the floor, the chair, the cushion, your clothing. And when you're ready, I invite you to open your eyes again and continue this exploration, looking around the room, finding objects, pausing with them, noticing the spaces between objects, pausing with these spaces. And as you're moving, seeing if you can include not only your breath, but also this feeling of the contact of touch of your body sat wherever you're sat or standing if you're standing. Notice that if bringing your attention to this sense of contact um, of your skin, of your body, uh, notice if that feels like it somehow brings you away from the level of detail of attention with the object. And finally, as you're moving your eyes around the room, you will have noticed that your head is probably also moving slowly. Can you feel your head and your neck moving as you're looking around the room? Sensing both the points of contact, but also the movement of the body. So we're now bridging our attention between the breath on the inside, the feeling of the neck and the body moving in small movements as you allow your eyes to travel around the space. Letting your eyes travel far away from your body and also close in. Seeing yourself, maybe seeing your hands, seeing your feet. I'm going to give you another couple of minutes now. I'm going to keep very quiet for you to explore in your own time. Whatever is following your curiosity, exploring how your attention might or might not be able to stay with more than one focus at any one time. For some of us, as I said, this can be really challenging. For others, it might feel more easy. Following your own rhythm, your own path now. Exploring 
the bridging of your attention with yourself, with the environment, and with the contact that you have with this environment. And in a moment, we're going to bring the exploration to a close. There's no rush. I'm just beginning to transition out of this practice. You might want to stretch your body. You might want to stand up if you've been sitting down. Having a little shake. Maybe having a drink of water if you've got a drink close by. Welcoming any yawns or sounds or sighs that want to come through. Making your way slowly, slowly back to the screen if your uh, computer has been somewhere else. Welcome back. So I'm going to um, put us into breakout rooms for you to have a chance to just reflect with somebody else how that experience was for you. Um, there's no pressure to join a room if you don't want to. You might want to take five minutes to do a little bit of journaling um, or just to have a body break to just get up and have a look outside the window, whatever you need. Um, so I will uh, assign rooms um, with two to three people in each room. Um, and if for any reason you're in a room and you want to be, you want to be in a room, but nobody's joined your room, um, please come back to the main room and I can assign you into another space. So we'll stay in these rooms for mm, about 10 minutes and then we'll gather back together um, and we can do some question and answers all together after this time. So is that okay, Andrea? I've got them assigned automatically. So I'll put these in. And again, if you're if you want to be in a room and nobody's joined you, um, then then come back and I can assign you to, to somewhere else. Okay. So really just a time for reflection. How how was that experience for you? So I've opened the rooms now and you should be able to hit join. Yeah, welcome back everybody. So I just wanted to let you know, I've just had a chance to have a little look through the chat. Um, I've put in a link to uh, Moshe Feldenkrais, um, who is the somatic practitioner that I mentioned. I'm not a Feldenkrais practitioner. It's not my area of speciality, um, but that's just a, a link to, um, uh, the work that, that, that's that been informing um, uh, particularly this exercise that I said I, I learned from somebody else um, and I've also put in there a link to a blog that I wrote for Schumacher uh, sometime last year um, which is a, a short kind of piece of writing around um, this idea of how we might practice placefulness um, and I'm in the middle of writing a, a slightly longer article around that at the moment. So if anyone's interested in staying in touch, you're really welcome to send me an email. Um, and I am really happy to share the slide and the presentation slides. I'm not quite sure how we do that, but I, <laughs> I can talk with Andrea and we can, we can figure out a way to get them to you. So we have, I think, about 15 minutes or so left of the session. And um, yeah, I just really wanted to open it up for a uh, reflection space, any questions, um, particularly anything maybe related more to um, the kind of yeah, classroom I'm, setting. I don't yeah, um, okay. We don't see the links that you put. I think you I don't see the links. Them. Ah, okay. Let me no. put again, let me put them in and see. Can you see this one? Sure, now we see, yeah. Ah, okay, sorry. It's because I put them in when you were in the rooms. Okay, and here was the second one. Um, which is the link to, um, I can't actually find it on the Schumacher blog, but that um, it was reposted by resilience.org. So I've put that on there. Um, yeah. 
yeah so yeah any questions feel really free um uh whatever in in whatever field is really welcome i'll answer them if i can yeah hi Hello. Uh, i have a question of whether you've um done these exercises with children Ah, oh, good question. No, I haven't. Um, so I uh, have always taught in an adult education setting. Um, so I haven't had the the opportunity to. Um, yeah, so I, not much, not, not much more I can, I can, I can say around that. Um, my sense is that often from my own experience uh, with, with my nephews, in some ways, this bridging, um, particularly in, in younger children is actually much more uh, familiar, um, that they're often actually uh, in a kind of broader sense of their attention. Um, uh, there's an interesting um, article by a theorist called Erin Manning, a, a Canadian theorist who, who speaks about, um, you know, particularly in infant development, this kind of undifferentiation, this sense of just broad connection is just natural. It's a natural state. And, and as we kind of develop, we're kind of... Um, uh, bringing ourselves out of that undifferentiated state, which obviously we need to in order to move through the world as adult beings. Um, uh, but I'm quite interested in this idea of like, if it was a possibility within us, even as a child, uh, then again, it's kind of a state that we have available to us potentially if we if we kind of choose to cultivate that more. And certainly certain cultures, certain um, societies might have learned to maintain a certain degree of this. Um, uh, uh, more than others um yeah but i don't have any particular experience myself of, of of doing this work with children but i think there is there is i mean i know that something like body mind centering has a whole um body of work dedicated to kind of infant um infant infant movement patterns um so you might want to look into that if it's of interest to you thank you oh, you're welcome Sure. Yeah. Somebody's written in the chat. I think it's schooling that undermines connectedness. And I, yeah, I think in many of our experiences, certainly my own, that that was a, yeah, a big, a big part of it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Feel free to write a, uh, if you have a question that you prefer to put in the chat, that's also really okay. And any reflections as well. It doesn't have to be questions. Um, yeah, if you have any reflections that you'd like to share from doing the exercise or from anything that you'd, you've heard, then it would be lovely to hear those as well. I can share a reflection. Um, it was, um, I noticed that as I was trying to keep attention to all these different things, that there was like that, um constant blabbering in my mind <laughs> um, and but the more things that they um attended to uh the less the blabbering happened <laughs> so it was really great it was almost like oh this can be really relaxing because for the first time my mind isn't talking but then I noticed how hard it is to not have your mind talking because I got so used to it um so it's an interesting contradiction you know you're yeah it, it it would be great to be so attentive that you just calm down sure. but that is can be very very hard if you're not used to it yeah for sure yeah and again this kind of idea of practice um you know really we're um particularly in, in my classroom setting you know at the beginning of every single class that I'm doing um I always start with at least a kind of 10-15 minute guided uh, sort of meditation, relaxation, exercise of some kind, neurosensory exercise of some kind, um, because it, it is that sense of like the, the practice of this, um, the, 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 the stretching into something um, and, and it not being necessarily easy to grasp from the beginning, but also not setting it up as a place that we have to go to where we would be good at it at all, but more just like exploring like, oh, yeah, what is happening for, for many of us? I don't know if anyone found this for many of us. Um, it can be like 
bringing our attention into the objects around us can be quite like we get quite absorbed or fixated in a way that means that we lose all sense of ourselves. Um, and like bringing back that attention to the breath can sometimes then bring us out of the world in some way. We feel a bit like we're in ourselves, but we're not kind of with what's around us. So this kind of practicing of like this inside outside contact space um, can, can, can bring a kind of greater sense of um, relationality, you know, like this, this interconnected, like that we're arising with the world as, the, as we are with the world, not oh, separate from it in some way. Yeah, yeah, beautiful reflection. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be lovely to hear any reflections from anyone else if anyone else feels able to. Yeah, I feel mostly sleepy and my eyes had a tendency to close. I can see in the chat. Yeah, yeah, also really, really familiar. And, um, you know, particularly when you start doing these kinds of neurosensory exercises, if you're if you're if you haven't done them before, um, one of the first sort of signs of the nervous system settling and relaxing is beginning to feel more tired, um, often because we're like over um, uh we're overriding you know so much of the time we're receiving so much stim stimulation um and that's another thing that i'm really clear about in my classrooms i always say at the very very beginning um you are so welcome to yawn you know you're really welcome to yawn to sigh to stretch um because actually this is often the body kind of going Oh, resting back into things. Um, and that that's actually really important for the digestion of knowledge as well. Um, particularly if it's, uh, you know, quite just a hard knowledge that, you know, some of the themes that we touch upon in, in the EMA can be quite distressing in some ways, you know, so how important it is to keep kind of actually allowing that rest space, um, allowing yourself to go and have a little sleep, a little nap after an exercise like this. So, yeah, yeah, really, I really resonate that uh, sleepiness can can definitely come up there. Um, and it might not always, you know, it, it might, um, it might be a kind of adjusting to that kind of state of being as well. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Sarah. Hello. Hi. Um, <clears throat> as well as your academic and scholarly work, I was just wondering if you're looking to take this outwards anywhere in any particular direction hmm. Out, outwards in what sense um where you can see that there's a, a large necessity in society so whether mm -hmm. it's trauma or for example mm -hmm. i come from an, a, a mountain guiding outdoor mm -hmm. adventure background and hence my you know i see the capitalist consumerist culture pervasive in even in that rural setting yeah. hence my interest in um what you're talking about at the moment so i'm just wondering if you are looking to take this outwards to read a, mm. reach a broader audience mm, yeah beautiful question thank you um i suppose i would say uh you know i'm not a trauma therapist i'm not a trauma specialist so there's immediately and i'm not a, and i'm not a neuroscientist so, so um there will be people working in those fields who are very much um particularly i would say you know in relation to, tra to trauma therapy which um you know is this kind of necessary and really kind of ripe at the moment um field of research um and there's a lot of people i would say in who are kind of specialized and, and and professionals within that field who are very much um you know working within society in addiction settings in in prisons in schools in in, in various ways um i uh for me as a teacher i suppose <laughs> you know my kind of place in which i'm like at, taking it out if, if you will is, is you know within within classroom um and I don't really identify particularly as an academic, although I am one, you know, being at Schumacher and I suppose at this, this, you know, this um, gathering of eco-versities that there's a, you know, we're kind of the academic institutions slightly at the edge of academic institutions um, mm. doing things, you know, slightly differently. Um, you know, I also have, I teach within, I teach um, movement and somatic work with, to a general public audience. So I have that kind of, um, uh, avenue to things I'm part of a community interest company that um, offers movement and creative art based explorations as lots of different facilitators um, 
and many of those are in a city offering kind of movement explorations in um, to disadvantaged peoples working in mental health settings working with older populations um, so I'm kind of connected into some of that and also I suppose my my interest is particularly around um, from this uh, almost like philosophical level of like what 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 is how important some of this might be for for really shifting our like cultural narratives um and, and 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 what what this might kind of mean on that level so i'd say i'm not um uh i'm not not <laughs> if you will um uh but i'm not actively involved in that other than the ways that i've described it at the moment largely because you know a different set of skills and a different and the invitation mm. you know if the invitations to do it are there and arise then I'd be you know really interested in that um have a yeah I have a lot of interest in that um but I just haven't had particularly the experiences so far I mean for me this this work around um you know, like connecting into into this nervous system exploration is really fresh it's really at the forefront of what I'm interested in right now um so it's not like I've got 20 years worth of a body of work to bring and to take out there it's very much like revealing as as we're going and and in part through the explorations that I'm doing with my Schumacher students you know that they're that they're kind of we're like learning together um yeah what, what's going on here and, and how might this be important particularly I think around this idea of um you know what happens when we settle our nervous system in some way before we learn what happens when we acclimatize to the classroom that we're in before we bring in the things that we're even learning about you know just those sort of things that can feel so small or minimal but can actually have a really big impact on how far we can go in our conversations how far we can risk thinking in kind of slightly more um, unusual ways around mm. what we would be interested in so yeah, I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, thank you for your question. I think your, you know, your work is going outwards, sowing the seeds with the students. Sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, I'm aware of the time and we need to bring this to a close. Uh, reading a couple of the questions. I know a few people have had to leave, so yeah.